Acts chapter 6, verse 8 to 15. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition rose around. Opposition ar arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and, and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses had handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Acts chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? To this he replied, verse 51. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not prosecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not yet obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I, have, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. Acts 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing. On that day, a great prosecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may all take a seat. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Inside Out Sunday celebration. And you've just witnessed some of Inside Out's best talents from uh, the praise and worship to the dancers, uh, even to our acting media team, uh, what else? All of them, no? We are, these inside out people are really very skilled and talented and we thank God for the talent that He has given to our young people. Now, last year in November, we also had the Inside Out Sunday. And during that time, we launched the Inside Out version 2.0, which is just a fusion of two ministries before. Because before, we had a ministry for the students, which we called Inside Out, and we also had a ministry for uh, the young professional or single adults, which we called Crossroads. But the leadership decided that we should uh, fuse the two ministries because anyway, fluid. They're kind of fluid. Uh, the single adults can lead the people in the, among the students. So we, we, we did that. We fused the two ministries, and we named it Inside Out. We named it Inside Out because it's the more popular name uh, outside the church. If you go to Savior, for example, outside the church, even in Divisoria or people in the workplace, 
they may know more about Inside Out than they may know more than they know about uh, Crossroads. So we decided to use Inside Out. So last year, we had a lot of changes in Inside Out. One of them is we stopped uh, in the hub, the worship gatherings there. We went here. We came here to the GCAF main, to uh, GCAF Central, is it? To GCAF Central. Not only because... The hub was closing, we were closing the hub, we were leaving the hub, but also because we saw that it is a helpful thing to do among the young people. Research has shown that if a young person has at least five older people surrounding him or her, he will have his faith until he dies. He will stick to his faith even up to his old age. So that's why it's very important that the older people here, the more mature and the wiser people here, are here surrounding our young people because you will aid our young people as they grow up and as they mature in their spiritual lives. Another reason why we allowed it to happen is that intergenerational worship is helpful not just for the young people, but also for the older generations, the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, because the young people, from the students to the single adults, they bring a vibrant atmosphere in the worship gatherings. So, medyo bibo ang atuang worship gatherings because of these young people. So, um, again, I would like to thank those people who have extended their help to Inside Out because last year I remember that we asked for the help of some of you that maybe we can, we can have our wider group meetings in your houses or maybe you can sponsor a wider group that uh, we can go to your house and you can uh, feed us because that's what wider groups do, eat. And uh, we also asked some of you to be wider group leaders. The younger couples here, even the more mature people, we ask you to become wider group leaders of our younger generations, the Gen X, Y, and Z. So, what is Inside Out up to now? By the way, the title of our message for this morning is Raising Up the Younger Generations. Inside Out, the ministry for the students and single adults, have these people in their care, in our care, the Gen Xers, Y, and the Z. Millennials are the Gen Y. We included some of the people in Gen X because there are some people who are not yet married. They're still single adults who are in their 40s, and they are still under Inside Out. So they are under Gen X. And um, let's start with Gen Z. What are we doing with the Gen Z? The Gen Z, or the iGen, are the people who are in high school and in colleges. Two years ago, there were news about Gen Z. It broke the internet, this news, because some of the Gen Zers were starting to work. They already graduated from college, and they are now starting to enter the workplace. And people don't know a lot about the Gen Z people, these students. But what are we doing in Inside Out for the Gen Z? If you are a student, high school or college student, know that there are gatherings for you in the church. For example, if you're a high school student, we have our inter-high school gatherings here in, in the church every Saturdays. Also, if you're in college... Even in high school, you can join our T180 in uh, three campuses right now. We have uh, in CU in partnership with SOM, we have in Liceo, and we have in Xavier University. But we have uh, seen that it's important to reach out to more campuses because there are a lot of young people in Cagayan de Oro. But we have also realized that it's not practical, and it's so time-consuming, and uh, 
man hour consuming if we go to each and every college or each and every campus here in CDO. So what we are trying to uh, come up with right now, it's still in the pipeline, we're still talking about it, is we will have T180s, these worship gatherings for the young people, in every area or by areas. So instead of T180 CU or T180 Savior, we will have T180 West, which will include the campuses from uh, Kongwa, COC, Liceo, there. And we may also have T180 Divisoria, or whatever the name will be. It's still in the pipeline. It will be uh, for the students of Xavier, uh, Lourdes, Corpus, or a Christian, and the campuses near Divisoria. We may also have uh, T180 Imketkai for MUS, no, uh, what's their, USTP, uh, COC, SPC, those schools near Limketkai. So that's what we're doing for the Gen Z. For the Gen X and Gen Y, what we're doing right now is we are asking these people in the workplace, these are our single adults, we are asking them to become the wider group leaders for the younger generations, for the Gen Z. It is favorable for our younger people, for the Gen Z, to have uh, people in the workplace as their wider group leaders because these people, these single adults, have first-hand experience of the outside world. So when they are in their workplace, they can apply what they learn from church. So they can also teach these things to the younger generation. For example, um, myself. When I uh, lead my wider group, I always tell them about my experiences in, at work. So, for example, during that day, I became very angry or very mad at someone. I tell them that. And I tell them how I reacted to it and how I managed that anger. And these people, as we will see later on, the younger people want to be very realistic and they want real people. They want to have relationships with real people. They don't like the people who say, I'm a Christian, but it seems like their Christianity is disconnected with their lives. For people who are single adults, yes, they are Christians, and yes, sometimes they fail in their workplaces. They become angry, they become impatient, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, there's still the grace which they cling to, and they can bring that experience to their wider groups. So who are these people? Who are the Gen X, Y, and Z? It's important for us to learn these so that we can uh, minister to our younger people. Because as I said a while ago, that a research show, a research from the United States, from an institution there, shows that if, if a child is surrounded by at least how many? Five Older people, they will stick to their faith. Their faith will stick with them even to their old age. So here's the Gen X, Y, and Z people. Let's talk about the shapers, the experiences, the happenings that shaped the lives of these generations. For Gen Xers, those who were born from 1960 to 1979, these are their shapers. The end of the Cold War which means that this, this generation is a peace-loving generation. Cold War, remember, this is the war against the uh, United States and uh, Russia. Cold War because they weren't really at war with missiles and armaments, but they were not talking with one another. So now it ended, it means that the Gen X are peace-loving generation. Capitalism also shaped them and the introduction of the personal computer. Also, latchkey kids. What is a latchkey? Mga Gen Xers. Latchkey is this. It's a key for your door, for your main door. Why do you have this, Gen Xers? Because during your childhood time, during the time when you were still in school, most of your parents were working. Not only your fathers, 
but also your mother. So this is the time when both the father and the mother were working. So we have keys for you. So you're called the latchkey generation. For the Gen Y, 9-11 was the main shaper. Because of 9-11, we are so consumed with our security, even our privacy. That's why you hear millennials talking about Facebook, um, gathering information about themselves. I remember one time we, I was talking with uh, a friend of mine. We were talking about something. I really forgot what we were talking about. Um, maybe a uh, drop shipping. It's called drop shipping. For those of you who don't know what drop shipping is, you're old and you just have to live with that. So we were talking about drop shipping. And uh, after our talk, I did not even touch my phone. I did not open any app from my phone. But when I opened my phone in face, on Facebook, I saw an advertisement of drop shipping immediately. And I started to wonder, maybe it's true that Facebook is listening to our conversations. I don't know, but we are concerned with our privacy. The internet was also utilized during the millennials time and globalization. So because of glo globalization and internet, it made the world very small. So now you see millennials, people who, are, who were born from 1980 to 94, 95, thereabouts, you see them working with their laptop computers and you see them traveling while working. Weird, right? For the older generations because you were used to working in an office. I remember when I traveled one time to a faraway land, in, in, I, I think it was in Italy, I stayed in a hostel and we had this roommate. She was Colombian. She was 23. Three or 24 at that time, I asked her, how long are you traveling? She said, I'm traveling for six months. And I said, what? Six months? Aren't you going to work during that time? And she said, I'm working. I'm, what's your work? I'm a marketer. And to my mind, I was thinking, what kind of person is this? going around the world, not thinking about work, not thinking about herself. But then, lately, just lately, I realized that most, many jobs are now online. And these online jobs can help you earn more than what you older people can earn in the offices. That's true. And you can travel the world and work at the same time. That's the Gen Y. Gen Z. These are the digital native, natives. These are people who have never known a time when they had no mobile phones, when there was no internet. So these are the mobile people. Social networks were introduced. And uh, one of the shapers, especially in the U.S., is the Great Recession, uh, the subprime mortgage crisis. And because of this, some researchers are saying that the Gen Z or the iGen will be a very hard-working generation because they experienced hardship during the Great Recession of 2008. Unlike Gen X, uh, Gen Y, I mean, unlike the millennials who have been in a stable economy and thus they are more complacent about their work, about their life. Now, for the Philippines, our researchers have divided the generations into two generations only. The first generation is the pre-martial law generation. And the second is the post-Marcus generation. Or if we put computers, it's like uh, the digital immigrants and the digital natives. Two generations, digital immigrants and digital natives. G digital immigrants are the people who have to learn computer, have to learn the internet so that they can use Facebook and so on and so forth. I remember my mom. Uh, Facebook is already there. Most of the young people, the Gen Y, are already using Facebook. 
Uh, most of them are also using Instagram and Twitter. My mom asked me one time, she said, Anak, son, please teach me how to use Facebook. And then I said, Mom, you're old. And then when I looked at my Facebook uh, friends, I saw some old people also, um, elderly people. And I said, okay, mom, I'll teach you how to use Facebook. Now, my mom uses Facebook. My mom is always on her iPad, in front of her iPad, and she's always on Facebook 24 hours a day, <laughs> up to 12 a.m. or 2 a.m. And I, I told her, mom, please stop using Facebook. Please stop opening your Facebook. And she says, I'm only reading articles on Facebook. And I think she's still in Gen X. Yeah, 1965. She's a Gen Xer. And these Gen Xer are very trusting generation. So whatever they read, they perceive it to be truth, even if it's fake news. And they share it on their profile. Tama? Yes. Oh, the children are always are clapping oh, and laughing. But Gen Y who are questioning, look at the behavior there. The Gen Y are questioning. They question. They ask, is this true? Or is this not true? The Gen Z, this generation is the more inclusive generation. They are able to dialogue with people of, the, of different faith, with people of a different uh, gender as they, or different race. But Gen Xers, you have a difficulty with that. In fact, you may get mad with the soji bill. Gen Yers, uh, I mean Gen Zers, they may say, it's okay, soji bill is okay. Because your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. Okay, you're not gay, okay, that's true for you, but I'm gay, that's true for me. So, so be it. That's how Gen Zers think. But why do we need to talk about these generations? Why do we need to know their behaviors and the, the, the experiences that shaped their lives? It's so that we will know how to handle them. And the Bible talks about generations. In fact, in every generation, there is a problem, mind you. Gen Xers, baby boomers, or the people in the silent generation before the baby boomers, you always think that the younger generations are lazy and useless generations. There is always bad things about the younger generations, right? But the truth is, every generation has a problem. In fact, Proverbs tells us this. There is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives, so that they can devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. So in this passage, we see three problems that every generation has. This is not just a problem that the Gen X, Gen Y, and Gen Z generations have, but even the baby boomers and the silent generation, you have this problem. The first problem that we see there is that this generation is a rebellious generation. It says, there is a generation that curses its father and is not blessed its mother. This is a generation, X, Y, Z, baby boomers. This is a generation who wouldn't listen to their parents. I see some parents tapping their kids here. You see, if you want the favor of God to be withdrawn from you, disrespect your parents. 
for the singles here who have parents still, you have to obey your parents. But for the couples here, you have to honor your parents. I remember my mom posting another post on Facebook. My mom is a Facebook addict. She posted this post, I think, two or three days ago. She said, I'll Englishize it. Um, <laughs> I forgot. Wait. A child who respects his parents will always tell where he is even if he is in his right age because he knows that he has a parent who is, say nag in English, who is worried for him. That's what she posted. And I remembered that tomorrow, some of the I.O. leaders will be traveling somewhere in um, UK, no? UK? Yeah, UK tomorrow. UK Bohol. We'll be traveling tomorrow up to Wednesday. And I, I was thinking, have I forgotten to ask for permission from my mom? Because I'm still living with my mom, which is a Gen Y thing. We live with our parents longer than the previous generations. We tend to marry later than previous generations. We tend to, we tend to delay everything. That's why it's called the Peter Pan generation. We want to be young always. But let me go back to my point. I was thinking if I was able to ask for the permission of my mom, and I just commented on her post. I said, Mom, uh, I'm going out. I'm traveling on Monday to Wednesday. <laughs> so I, I did that on her post. Because I want to obey my mom. Because I want to respect my mom. Because I want to honor my mom. But there are a lot of young people here, not here, maybe outside of GCAF, because young people of GCAF are very respectful. There are many young people who disrespect their parents. That instead of obeying them, these young people curse them instead. That's why these young people can never have the favor of God in their lives, no matter what they do, because they dishonor their parents. But that's not the only problem that we see from Proverbs. Another problem is that this generation is arrogant. It says that there is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, mapagmataas. And their eyelids are lifted up. They think that they are always right. They are never wrong, this generation. I was talking with Engineer Bebot a while ago this morning. Engineer Bebot is one of the executives in Rebisco. He said that he has a problem with some of the millennials and Gen Zers in his company. Because not only are these generations so um, complacent about their work, these generations also think that they are right, even if they're wrong. And you know what? We never want to admit that we are wrong, many of us. I think it's very important for each one of us, not just for the young people here, to know that sometimes we don't know some things. To admit that sometimes, or maybe most of the time, we are wrong. And we have to accept the corrections from other people. To know that sometimes we need to adjust 
our thinking. Because we become arrogant if we don't. So we are rebellious. There is a rebellious generation. There is an arrogant generation. And the third problem that we see from, the, from, from Proverbs is this. There is a generation that is unkind. It says there that there is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among them, from among men. You see, when I'm driving, I hate it when someone, when I'm in the, in, in, in the middle of traffic, I hate it when someone knocks on my window and begs. I don't like that. Because I see other people selling stuff in the streets while these people are just begging. Some people have said, Ton, that's wrong, Ton. <laughs> Sometimes you have to give, Ton. Because they are needy. Maybe, sometimes. But I just hate it. Maybe I'm in that generation. I have a confession for you. I'll confess a very dark sin that I did, I think, two or three weeks ago. One time, one day, I was in Divisoria. I went to a store there. I stayed there and uh, I was drinking my beverage and eating something when a street kid entered the store and asked for money. So I said, uh, you can't be here because uh, there are other customers here. I'm a customer here. Uh, can you please leave this place? And he left the place. But outside the door of that place, of that cafe, this kid started to shout as loud as he can. And people inside can hear him. I can hear him. And if you know me, I don't like noise. That's why I don't, I don't know how I became the I.O. leader because the young people are very noisy and active. But I hate noise. Even if I'm in my car, sometimes I don't want the radio turned on because I don't like noise. But this street kid, he's there, outside, but shouting, and I can hear him. And at that time, I was an irritable person. I was an irritable Christian. I was an impatient Christian because I was so busy during that day, and I had to do a lot of things during that day. So here's what I did. I went out the cafe. I told him, aren't you going to stop? Aren't you going to stop? And that's not the only thing that I did. I started to choke him. And he hit his head on the railing of the stairs. And I stopped. And I saw in his eyes the look of stop, stop. And he was about to cry. I went inside the cafe and immediately I realized that what I did was wrong. I felt so guilty that I cried that day. I haven't cried for a million years, but that day I cried three times because I was so guilty. And when I was reading Proverbs, I said, oh, I'm like a part of this generation who wants to devour the poor. Pastor Ruben a while ago reminded me to continue the story because this 7 a.m. service, I stopped there. But the continuation of the story is this. Two days after, I saw the kid because I said, I'm going to make it up to him. So I saw the kid two days after, and I treated him to 7-Eleven. So I asked him, oh, what do you want? He said, I want, uh, what was it that he wanted? Sisig? I think it was Sisig. I want Sisig rice. In Bisaya, of course, no? I want Sisig rice. And, uh, okay, you get Sisig rice there. 
There's no CC guys. Okay, you get something else. So he, he got the tuna omelet. And then we were in the counter. He said, how about drinks? <laughs> okay, you go get some drinks. And then he came back to me and he said, can I bring some for my brother? Ah, oh, he's a sweet kid. And really, he is a sweet kid. I got to know him a little better. He is a sweet kid. Sometimes we can be judgmental to these people. Sometimes we are right. But sometimes we just need to get to know these people, their hardships. So these are the problems that we see with every generation. They are rebellious, arrogant, and unkind. But still, God can use everyone, the young, the ordinary people. We've read the story of Stephen in the book of Acts. We saw how this young man was used by God, was empowered by God to become the tipping point of the evangelistic work of God throughout Asia. We'll see that. We see that Stephen was confident. In fact, he was called by the Sanhedrin, mga judges ni sila. He faced them. He said, you stiff-necked people. Oh, confidence. We need that confidence. And we are given that confidence by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God can use us through the confidence that He gave us. Now you may say, Ton, I'm a very young person. Kuya Tons, I'm a very young person. I'm still in college. I'm still in high school. Uh, I'm still 24 years old. How can I be confident in dealing with older people with, with whom I meet and deal with? But you see, Stephen is also a very young person. He, was, he died at the age of probably 29. He was a very young person when he started his ministry. But he was confident because he had the power of the Spirit. You may say, Ton, my job is just, I'm just a, a, a banker. I'm just a nurse. My business is not as big as some other businesses in Cagayan. But you see, Stephen is just a waiter. Yes, Stephen is a waiter. The story goes like this. The apostles who were preaching the Word of God throughout uh, Jerusalem, they said that, hey, we shouldn't stop preaching the gospel just because we have to wait for the widows, just because we have to serve the widows. Because they were torn between preaching the gospel and serving the widows. So they said, why don't we get seven people? Seven people to serve these widows. And they found the seven people and one of them was Stephen. So Stephen is a server, is a waiter. So you don't have to say, Don, I'm just a waiter, I'm just a nurse, I'm just a banker, I'm just a small-time businessman. God will use you as He used Stephen. Stephen was confident because he was filled with the Spirit of God. In fact, in verse 10, it says that they could not stand up against the wisdom of the Spirit that God gave Stephen as he spoke. Sometimes we ask God this, Lord, give me a miracle. Lord, show me a miracle in my life today. Lord, do great things in my life today. We pray that, but we don't want to be put in a situation that requires a miracle. We don't want to be put in a situation where God can show His wonders to us. We just want the miracle. We just want the wonders of God. We just want the good things and not the bad things that come with the good things. But no. Because we are filled with the Spirit, 
we can go through these negative circumstances so that at the end of the day, we will see the miracles and the great wonders of God. The last thing that we see from Stephen is that he was Christ-like. He said in uh, chapter 7, verse 60, Lord, don't take this against them when he was being killed. Don't take this against them. It was very Christ-like because Christ also said that. If we want to be used by God, we have to know who Jesus Christ is and we have to follow Jesus Christ and obey His commands. Now you may ask, but how did God use Stephen? If we read chapter 8, of the book of Acts, we will see how Stephen's life was the tipping point of the evangelistic mission of God in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said that you, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. In Acts chapter 8, after the killing of Stephen, it says here, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. After the death of Stephen, there was a great persecution which led to the scattering of the Christians throughout Judea and Samaria. Let me repeat the verse. All were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. But I skipped a phrase there. It says, all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. All except the apostles. Meaning to say, the apostles stayed there in Jerusalem. They had nothing to do with the evangelism of outside Jerusalem. Those who spread the word of God outside Jerusalem were the ordinary people, not the disciples, not the apostles. And in our time, not the pastors. So we can say here that the ordinary people, you and I, will be used by God in any way that He can. In fact, we are better in being evangelists than the people who are full-time in church. Why? How many full-time people are there in church? Just a few. How many? 20? 20. How many people here, how many of you here are in your workplaces, in businesses where you can reach out to more people? One million. Two million. I don't know how many. But a lot more than the full-time people. We just have to allow God to use us. Because the problem with us is that we are not confident enough. Why? Because we are not filled with the Spirit. Yes, we are filled, but we don't know that. We forget that we have the power of the Holy Spirit and we don't trust the Holy Spirit. But if we allow God to use us, I don't know what will happen to the world. So the question that I am leaving you this morning is this. Will you allow God to use you? In your workplace, in your businesses. Let me be more specific. How 
can God use you in your sphere of influence? And let me be even more specific because this is IO Sunday. How can you help the young people? You see, we have a lot of services in Inside Out. We have the if you have this, you can you can get this at the back later on if you want to sign up. We have the praise and worship, publication and social media, integration, arts and craft, performing arts, multimedia, we have community outreach, and kids central. The young people of our church, though many cannot do this on our own. We need the help of the older generation. And that's why we want your help. How can you help us? I want you to pray about it and get your copy later at the back. Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you for the video that we saw a while ago about the life of Jiggy. We thank you for his example to us. We thank you for his life of service to the young people of our church. We thank you for how he has allowed himself to be used for your glory. Lord, we also thank you for our young people here in church from the high school students, the college students, to the single adults. We thank you for the talents that they've shared this morning, given their time. Lord, we pray that you bless these young people, our students, Lord, we pray that they will excel in their studies. We pray that the temptations during college, especially, will not hit them. And they will, ab they will be able to say no to these temptations. We pray that these young people will become people who respect their parents, people who obey their parents, and people who honor their parents. We pray for our single adults, even for those who are in the workplaces. We pray that you help them excel in their work and in their businesses. We pray for lives of integrity in the workplace. We pray also for our parents in this church. We thank you, Lord, for giving them to us. We thank you for their love to their children. We thank you for your guidance and protection towards them. Lord, we pray that in this church, families will be built up in the knowledge of you. We pray that families will always be together we pray for protection of the marriages and of the family. Lord, we pray that the children here will not be a part of the statistics of children of divorcees. So we pray for our couples here. Protect them, guide them, seal them and their houses. Lord, we pray that 
all the generations of this church will glorify you throughout their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.